Thank you. The next item of business is the debate on motion 11831 in the name of Shona Robertson on Scotland's public service values. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. Uh, I note we don't seem to have the government minister responsible for closing in the chamber as yet, and perhaps we could chase that up. But I think nonetheless we will have to start the debate in his absence, which is regrettable. I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson, to speak to and to move the motion. Around 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'll, I'll move the, the motion in my name at the start. Um, people right across Scotland, including all of us here in this chamber, rely on public services, whether that be our children and young people getting high quality education and training, our loved ones accessing the right treatment and care when they are unwell, victims and witnesses of crime being supported through the justice system or the most vulnerable members of our community being supported through our progressive social security system. This government is determined uh, to maintain and improve our public services despite the most challenging financial situation since devolution. Our block uh, grant funding, which is uh, derived from UK government spending, has fallen by 1.2% in real terms since 2022-23, and our capital spending power is due to contract by almost 10% in real terms over five years. Our approach to maintaining our public services is informed by our shared values as set out in Scotland's national performance framework to treat people with kindness, dignity and compassion. These values are alongside our missions of equality, opportunity and community guide everything we do. We believe everyone in Scotland should experience high quality services that are delivered effectively and efficiently. And where people need further support for whatever reason, public services should be able to identify these needs early, build relationships with people to understand their needs and work together to support them in whatever way they need. Crucially, we also believe that those with the broadest shoulders are asked to contribute a little more. This is right and fair, and our progressive approach, our social contract, sets Scotland apart from the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, as I've said uh, many times now, the Chancellor's autumn statement was a worst-case scenario for Scotland. The fiscal settlement from the UK government undermines the viability of public services in Scotland and indeed across the whole of the UK. Responsibility for this situation lies uh, with the UK government, a decade of austerity, Brexit undermining living standards and the calamitous Liz Truss mini-budget. And when faced with a choice in the autumn statement on how to use the £27 billion of fiscal headroom the Chancellor had available to him, he chose to cut taxes at the expense of public services. Indeed, there are real terms cuts across a number of UK government departments, including health. Our values and missions are at the heart of the 2024-25 Scottish Budget and have informed all of the choices that we've made in response to an incredibly challenging economic environment. Importantly, Presiding Officer, we have not seen the UK government similarly prioritised public services through its recent policy decisions, in fact, quite the reverse. Within the constraints of the current devolution settlement, we are using all of the powers available to us to maximise investment in our public services. Indeed, the Scottish Fiscal Commission have estimated that our income tax policy choices since devolution will raise an additional £1.45 billion in 2024-25 compared to if we had matched UK government policy. These spending decisions build on our successful legacy of investing in our public services and delivering meaningful reform, which has improved outcomes for many people across Scotland. For example, the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 underpins the most significant public service reform since devolution, which continues to deliver significant savings and improved outcomes. Police Scotland is on track to deliver cumulative savings of over £2 billion by 2026, and the creation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has removed around £482 million from the fire service cost base over the last 10 years. We've... Yes, John Mason. 
Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary, Deputy First Minister, for giving way. Um, I very much agree with her about the police and the fire service and kind of decluttering the landscape. Does she think there's scope for further decluttering? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I do. I think there is a lot of opportunity and scope um, for shared services, for public bodies working together and potentially, in some cases, uh, merging. I think we just have to be careful, though, that in doing so, we keep the focus on delivery rather than organisational change, because there is a danger uh, that uh, sometimes that can happen. I, in my letter, 48-page letter, I think, to FPAC pre-Christmas, laid out some of the detail of the extensive 10-year reform programme, but very happy to hear uh, suggestions of how we can go further than uh, that. I'll, very briefly. Willie Rennie. I'm still a bit shocked that the Cabinet Secretary is relying on police reform as an example of great reform by the Scottish Government. We remember we had three chief constables in almost as many years. It cost more money than it saved. The reality was that it was a disaster, especially with the centralisation of the control rooms. Why is she using that as an example? Well, Cabinet Secretary. I think if in terms of the outcome for victims of serious crime, particularly sexual offences, rape or murder, if you look at the results that Police Scotland have now been able to deliver consistently across Scotland, then that, for me, is the most important outcome from that reform. We've also prioritised tackling poverty, particularly child poverty, and have made significant progress by working collaboratively and creatively with partners. And as a result of this government's policy interventions, including the expansion of the Scottish Child Payment, it's estimated that 90,000 fewer children will live in relative and absolute poverty in 2023-24. I know the Tories don't want to hear about child poverty, but this government does want to talk about child uh, poverty. Uh, could I just take this opportunity to interject? If members wish to uh, raise an issue, they know that there are ways to do that, including standing up and seeking to make an intervention. Cabinet Secretary, please continue. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Just to, to remind members, it's estimated that 90,000 fewer children will live in relative and absolute poverty in 2023-24, and notably poverty levels are lower in Scotland than in England. And, uh, Presiding Officer, for over 75 years, our National Health Service has been a universal uh, public service, free for all at the point of need. And we are resolutely committed to those founding principles and have a, a strong record of investing in our health and social care sector. For example, we have invested £193 million in our National Treatment Centres programme. We opened two new centres in Fife and Highland in spring last year, and two further centres will open or expand early this year. Together, these centres are planning to deliver over 20,000 additional procedures by 2024-25, which will improve patient outcomes. But as I know, officer, alongside mitigating the impacts of UK government decisions, the scale of the current financial challenge means we must change the way that we deliver public services in Scotland. We know that in the short term, we need to reduce costs and improve effectiveness uh, further. However, as we look at the demographic projections for Scotland made worse by Brexit and the UK government's approach to immigration, combined with the anticipated level of demand on public services, we know we must change the way we deliver services in the long term to fundamentally improve people's lives and reduce their need for ongoing support. Yes, Jackson Carlos. Inward migration into the UK was at a record level last year, but not to Scotland. Why? Cabinet Secretary. If you look at um, migration in terms of uh, net in migration from the rest of the UK, then we have a, a situation where at least 10,000 uh, people are moving from the rest of the UK, who may come from various parts of the world before that. They come from the re rest of the UK to Scotland. And that is 7,000 of those each year are of working age population. I would have thought that's something the Tories would welcome. Clearly not. Uh, no, thank you. No, thanks. Um, in December, I provided the Finance and Public Audit Committee with a detailed update that set out this government's aims and principles for an ambitious 10-year programme of public service uh, reform. This update included the actions that we need to take over the next two years to bring together a common approach for reform, to further align our policies and reform programmes, and to enable and empower our partners to act. 
In short, presiding officer, this government's vision is for all public services to be person-centred and designed around the unique needs of individuals, focused on prevention and prioritising early intervention and support to reduce the need for crisis intervention in the future, to be place-based and designed in ways that best meet the distinctive needs of communities across Scotland and built on partnership and creative collaboration with partners. Achieving this vision will not be easy. And the Scottish Government can't do this alone. So we want to build a consensus around these new ways of working with uh, local government, third sector and other partners um, to, to achieve that. Presiding officer, this government has a clear plan to deliver reform. We're working with local government and the public to take forward reforms that enable us to change how services are delivered at a local level. We remain committed to delivering the Local Governance Review and Democracy Matters alongside COSLA, exploring single authority models and to deliver on commitments to reform, funding and accountability in the Verity House Agreement. We're aligning all of our major policy reforms and investments around our shared vision for public services. Across our education and skills sector, we're reforming to make sure that everyone in Scotland is supported to fulfil their potential and we'll continue to support schools and local authorities to improve the attainment of children and young people impacted by poverty. And this is underpinned by £1 billion worth of investment in the school attainment challenge this parliamentary term. In our justice system, we're continuing to reform our justice system to prioritise victims and witnesses protect frontline services, make better use of digital approaches and support greater collaboration between partners to keep communities safe. In health and social care, the development of the National Care Service is building on our strong commitment to high quality, consistent and fair public services. Our programme of co-design is making sure that people are at the heart of these developments and human rights principles are embedded as we deliver for more than 230,000 people in Scotland who receive social care support. Presiding officer, we're also driving innovation and in making public services more efficient as set out in the resource spending review. Our single Scottish estate programme has already reduced the size, costs and emissions of the public sector estate. This has delivered savings in excess of £4 million through the co-location of services and the closure of surplus offices in Edinburgh and Dundee. And work is underway to consolidate the public sector estate in Glasgow from five premises into one new net zero carbon property to deliver associated carbon reductions alongside anticipated revenue savings in excess of £3 million per year from 2028-29. We're expanding the use of the National Collaborative Procurement and this approach has the potential to deliver significant efficiencies for every pound invested in Scottish Government-led collaborative procurement, over £40 is returned in financial benefits. In 2022-23, over £130 million was saved uh, through this uh, approach. Digital technology and infrastructure is also a key enabler of public service reform. For example, we invested £1.8 in a new digital dermatology service in 2023. This programme has the potential to reduce demand for outpatient appointments by up to 50% and will lead to a better and quicker service for patients, as well as reduce pressure on our workforce. Uh, the Scottish Government is continuing to carefully review its own workforce numbers to ensure that we're delivering for the people of Scotland as effectively and efficiently as possible. From March 2022 to the end of September 2023, the size of our contingent workforce has reduced by 27%. Uh, thereby uh, reducing reliance on uh, temporary uh, staff and contractors. Finally, uh, presiding officer, to conclude, I've been clear that the Scottish Government cannot do this alone. Collaboration is central to how we deliver ambitious reform across the, the public sector. In the last year, we strengthened our collaboration with local government, public bodies, business in the third sector. We've worked effectively uh, with the Scottish Green Party through the Butte House Agreement and I welcome continued collaboration across this chamber as we seek to deliver collectively uh, for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Sanjesh Gohani to speak to and move Amendment 11831.2. Dr Gohani. Yeah, I wish to draw uh, members' attention to my register of interests as a practising NHS GP and uh, move the motion in my name. Well, we've listened to the Deputy First Minister and she's making out as though the SNP hasn't actually been in charge of public services for the past 16 years. Once again, 
this SNP government treats the people who really matter, the public and public sector workers, as if they're fools. SNP ministers persistently refuse to admit their failures. They expect everyone to believe they are competent, despite overwhelming evidence. And to pay for their incompetence, they go all out to tax workers and businesses for working hard. The Scottish Retail Consortium says SNP will be back for even more of your taxes next year because this SNP government will fail to reform the public sector. The Deputy First Minister claims her party has created a legacy of successful public service reform as an improved outcomes for people and communities, including health and social care. Really? Well, this is as delusional as Humza Yusuf's fantasy economics calculation that independence would lead Scottish households to being £10,000 per year better off. And it's, I, I will, yes. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member uh, mentioned health and social care, which gives me an opportunity to ask him why uh, his government is uh, basically reducing health and so social care spending uh, down by £8 billion. That's a cut of 4.7%. How can he justify that? Dr. Kohani? I think the First Minister needs to concentrate on the fact this is not only the Scottish Parliament, but you are in charge of healthcare here in Scotland. And that's what you should be doing. In fact, it's uh, little wonder uh, the Deputy Dr. Kohani, First... uh, yes. I would remind all members that we need to speak through the chair because otherwise you're referring to me and I have no responsibility for that. Dr. Kohani. It's little wonder the Deputy First Minister on November the 20th last year refused to confirm when asked whether SNP ministers always tell the truth. Today, however, we're debating Scotland's public service values. So let's start by considering the SNP's catalogue of shame and the public services of healthcare, education and procurement. Lengthy A&E waiting times targets not met. Worsening cancer treatment waiting times with a quarter of patients waiting two months to see a specialist. And now today we have reports that Scotland has some of the worst cancer survival rates in the world. Woeful workforce planning, lacking ambition, while vacancy rates for nurses are at record levels and a four-year high across many other NHS professions. On public health, the SNP, by its own admission, has taken its eye off the ball. Drug and alcohol-related deaths in Scotland are higher than anywhere else in Europe. 1,300 babies were born with drug dependency since 2017. It's disgraceful. This SNP government is all about sign bites and promises that they consistently fail to deliver upon telling us each time that lessons will be learnt. Let's look at school-aged children. The SNP failed to address educational attainment gaps, another failed promise. 16 years of botched SNP reforms that blew a billion pounds have ruined an education system that was once the envy of the world. According to a poll in the Scotland newspaper just this week, the majority of Scots believe the SNP is running public services poorly. Now, when it comes to setting an example to others in Scotland, the SNP sits a very low bar. There's a police investigation into its party finances, fueling doubts about transparency and adherence to the rule of law. Of course, we're well accustomed to the SNP blaming its failures and incompetence on others. And no, I'm not talking about the Scottish Greens, though some in this chamber clearly do blame them. The SNP is also quick off the mark to make claims about others that don't stand up to scrutiny. Take the misleading post on the Scottish Government's official Twitter account claiming the autumn statement had only resulted in an extra £10.8 million of funding for our NHS. But this is just spin because the Treasury provided a record £43 billion pounds to fund public services in Scotland. And this Scottish Government can spend the funding in any way that it wants. Just Members. as the SNP, just as the SNP Government decided not to spend £18 billion pounds on Scotland's NHS that the SNP Government received by way of consequentials from NHS spending down south since coming to power. £18 billion. It's about SNP choices, like having 160 officials 
costing £9.77 million a year on preparations for a bloated national care service, or no, or £7 million per year on pretend overseas embassies, millions on a failed deposit return scheme, hundreds of millions on ferries. I mean, I could go on. Presiding officer, while we lament the performance of the SNP Green Government, we must stress our admiration for Scotland's amazing public sector workers who deliver vital services. The trouble is, the trouble is, these workers are undermined by the SNP government's mismanagement year in, year out. They are also let down by the SNP's failure to properly support local government. To deliver well and stay true to public service values, we really do need to do things differently. We need to recognise a reorganisation of Scotland's public se sector that prioritises efficiency, preventative care and productivity. No one is saying reform is easy. The Scottish Parliament's Finance and uh, Public Administrations Committee has been tasked with conducting an inquiry into this. It is important work. Audit Scotland has called for urgent reform and highlights the SNP Green Scottish Government has made no progress since 2016. Reform is vital in order to develop and deliver a long-term financial and deal with the pressures. The Scottish Conservatives believe the principle of the Christie Commission on the future public services delivery are in, as important today as they were when published in 2011. Back then, the Scottish Government was told that unless Scotland embraces a radical new collective culture and collaboration through its public services, both budgets and provision are forecast to buckle under the strain. A fragmented, complex, opaque system hampered with collaboration between organisations. This top-down approach lacks accountability whilst failing to deliver to the needs of individuals and communities. The Scottish Government has not heeded what the Christie Commission has said. Instead, the SNP has the highest taxes in the UK, this despite receiving around £2,000 per Scot more from UK Treasury than people in the rest of the United uh, uh, Kingdom. Dr Cahalley is about to conclude. Would if I could. But we need to grasp the thistle. Reform is possible if there is a will to do so. The SNP raising of taxation to record levels in the history of devolution while public services continue to have their capacity reduced demonstrates the SNP's public sector model is unsustainable. A major review of Scotland public sector is required and must be implemented lest our services face a disastrous collapse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Gohani. And I now call on Michael Mara to speak to Move Amendment 11831.1. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and I gladly move the amendment in my name. Uh, there is a very important discussion to be had about the urgently needed reform of our public services in Scotland in order that they are fit to meet the huge challenges that we face today responding to climate change, demographic change and technological change. Uh, sadly, on the basis of the motion before us today, it doesn't really rise to that opportunity. Mangled through uh, the party spin machine, the government's motion comes to us, for, I think, frankly, from another planet, one in which the SNP has ever had a genuine interest or indeed a credible plan to reform public services in Scotland. Back in the real world, um, we, uh, the SNP have never been invested in the hard, honest work of public service reform. They came to power in 2007, presiding officer, on a platform of no reform, and they've spent 17 years doing just that. The single change that matters to them has come ahead of all else. So we've had populism rather than progress and party before people. And don't just take my party political word for it. In 2023, the Parliament's Finance and Public Administration Committee conducted a wide-ranging inquiry into the Scottish Government's public service reform agenda or lack of it. The committee heard an abundance of evidence, including from Audit Scotland, which laid bare uh, the paucity of the government's abysmal track record of reform. Uh, they said, and I quote, there was limited evidence of any real difference in improving the quality and effectiveness of services provided to the public. Um, and what little reform this government has engaged in has, of course, been botched and often reversed in fairly short order. The motion that we're debating today cites health and social care partnerships as one of the government's successes. So successful, of course, that they are to be scrapped as part of their chaotic national care service plans. 
themselves, of course, an unmitigated disaster with spiralling costs, no progress after years of prevarication and delay, and incompetent ministers saying proposals are, and I quote, a little bit hard to get their head around. Um, all the while, delayed discharge soars across Scotland, now, just in recent weeks, at the worst ever level. And despite the Deputy First Minister's personal commitment to end delayed discharge, and discharge entirely by the end of the year. That year, of course, was 2015, not 2023. Day by day, GP access and NHS dental care are increasingly a myth for families across Scotland. Or take education reform, President Officer. Three years on from the SQA scandal, the SQA was, of course, rightly to be scrapped and Education Scotland replaced on the roll, unabated, unchanged, unrepentant, rolling across the forest of reports and commissions that lie now on the floor undelivered. Any real possibility of reform is stifled by the Government. The latest Cabinet Secretary announcing just in November that the one attempt at reform from the last decade, John Swinney's useless regional improvement collaboratives, are to be wound down. What a track record! Of success. And so committed are this government to not reforming education that just last month the Deputy First Minister slashed the education reform budget. Any reform, any programme of reform must genuinely be about improving the lives of the population. And the absence of the reform, any programme of reform, of adaptation to a changing country means our services have become less efficient and ever less appropriate to the needs of our citizens. That places those services in a spiral of decline. One in six Scots languishing on an NHS waiting list. PISA figures showing Scottish pupils a year behind their English counterparts in maths. Falling life expectancy in this country. It does really matter. And we have to get reform right for the sake of the public services on which we all rely. I'm afraid the government's reality-denying motion does little to fix the mess they've made of our NHS or our education system. And the Tory amendment this afternoon, I'm afraid it references the Christie Commission principles, and we've heard a little bit about that already. I do wonder whether if we should just not collectively acknowledge that none of this was ever implemented. And, and not that it was wrong, not that those principles were uh, that were, were uh, incorrect and that they weren't based on sound values. Indeed, much of what Campbell Christie had to say was prophetic. It set out the consequences of an adequate government, and that has come true to the detriment of the country. But all of this was 13 years ago. And frankly, I find the continued use of Campbell Christie's name to validate an approach that has been willfully ignored to be disrespectful. It's the antithesis of the call of practical reforming cooperation that his values espoused in his work in our trade union movement across Scotland. Christie called for a programme that was urgent and sustained. Nothing could be further from the truth. After 16 years of decline, Scottish Labour is clear our public services are in desperate need of reform. But we know by the cold reality of experience and the chaotic heat of current conduct that this government cannot be trusted to do it. Only by getting rid of Scotland's two bad governments can any meaningful change take place. Thank you, Mr Marra. Uh, I think Mr Marra actually is seated and has concluded his remarks. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I now call on Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie. It, what a pompous, insensitive title for a debate. Lofty speeches about wars like us when people are stuck in ambulances outside A&E departments, when they wait in pain for ever longer NHS waiting lists, when children from poor backgrounds are stuck in poor educational outcomes, when people desperate for a home see the SNP government slash their housing budget and the drug death rate remains the highest in Europe. This debate is a sign of a government which has lost touch with the lives of ordinary people and their struggles. This debate isn't about public service values. It's all about the SNP government setting out their excuses and providing cover for what will be a savage budget ahead. They are hunting for everyone, anyone, as the cause for the financial predicament of their own making. Brexit, the Tories, the pandemic, and probably somehow 
the Welsh Labour Government and Keir Starmer as well. They are all to blame from the SNP as the true cause of the SNP's mismanagement of the public finances and a failure to reform public services. Now, I've got a test. The more the SNP people hunt for blame, the more that we know, the deeper the financial hole that they are in. I agree that the Conservatives have been a terrible government. I agree that Brexit is damaging too. But these are not new revelations. They have not just happened. We have known this for some time. Why are the SNP suddenly surprised and panicking now? We've heard the warnings from the Christie Commission, Audit Scotland, the Scottish Fiscal Commission for years. Take the Scottish Fiscal Commission. They warned in May 2018 that the Scottish Government was facing a £1.7 billion shortfall in the public finances over the following five years. They said back then, five years ago, they said reduced expectations for wage growth will result in a significant drop in income tax revenues as Scotland's economy lags behind the rest of the UK with growth remaining below 1% a year until 2023, last year. The Auditor General warned, at least as far back as 2018, again five years ago, that the NHS was not in a financially sustainable position. He repeated his warnings in November 2022. Failure to make the necessary changes to how public services are delivered will likely mean further budget pressures in the future. Now, Scotland's NHS boards are forecasting a deficit this year of £395 million. And the Christie Commission, way back in 2011, 13 years ago, warned about the need to increase preventative spend to stop demand swamping public service capacity. No. Despite all of those warnings, stretching back years, apparently now it's someone else's fault. The panic amongst the SNP ministers has been concerning to observe. I have never witnessed them cutting budgets to this degree in year in the way that they have this financial year. And who suffered? Colleges and universities, twice. Farmers with the farm support. Flexible workforce development fund, gone this year. Even the NHS budget wasn't safe, no. In total, that's 525, you should listen to this, £525 million cut in this year's budget. Education, down £165 million. Transport, £145 million cut. NHS, £70 million cut. All cuts in year. A chaotic management of the public finances. And there has been no substantial reform of public services during their tenure in office. Take education. John Swinney's education bill, that was stripped out, it was abandoned. And the last remnants of those measures, the regional improvement collaboratives, have just been torn up by the new Education Secretary. Jenny Gilruth has delayed the scrapping of the SQA and the Hayward reforms. We're going to have another debate about that in the next few weeks. Delayed as well on health and social care. The big answer from the SNP was the National Care Service. But that's been delayed and watered down. And it will scrap their previous last supposed reforms, the health and social care partnerships. Through the Education Committee, we looked at colleges and their regionalisation. I found it very difficult to find any significant benefit from the changes. And the colleges are now a shadow of their former selves. Of course, there was police centralisation, which the Cabinet Secretary was boasting about, but that resulted in three chief constables in almost as many years. And the rushed control room centralisation. I've got to remember this. The tragic events of that crash at the side of the M9 motorway that led to the deaths of Lamara Bell and John Yule. Now, that was a direct result of a hasty, kazakazi, kamakazi approach to the centralisation of the control rooms. It was unforgivable about what happened. That was not something to boast about. This is plainly not a government in of, of competent reform. It too often ducks reforms, probably because when it does try reform, it mishandles those reforms. But the real proof must be in the outcomes. A yawning poverty-related attainment gap. 
a housing emergency declared by many councils across the country, drug deaths, the highest in Europe, record long NHS waiting times, delayed discharge at a high rate. That's not a record to boast about. Thank you, Mr Rennie. Uh, we will now move to the open debate. I would advise members that we do have some time in hand this afternoon, so there are plenty of time for interventions, should members so wish. And I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank the Government for uh, bringing forward this hugely important uh, debate on a subject that is often overlooked but is absolutely critical to the success of our public services going forward. Um, and I also welcome the Government's openness in their motion to uh, constructive contributions to uh, suggestions of things that could be taken forward to move this uh, agenda forward. There is a real opportunity to articulate Scotland's public service values and how they inform our approach to delivering for the people of Scotland. It is good, of course, uh, when we embark or as we move through this process to have the vision and much um, has been said about Christie. And I had a, a read back through Christie this afternoon um, and those clear four principles around about empowerment, partnership, prevention and efficiency. Um, and while some reform has, of course, happened, reading Christie now, those mes messages, of course, still clearly resonate and form a really solid basis and a guiding uh, principles for taking work forward. Um, I just want to uh, address a number, of, uh, a number of issues, starting off, first of all, with finance. Um, finances will always be challenging, and I think that's the environment we live in now, in the future, and in the past. Indeed, when you look at Christie in the post-2008 crash, um, that was recognised as part of the backdrop to the environment Christie was working in. Um, but I also recognised uh, in Christie that additional funding on its own was only part of the issue and wasn't uh, of itself the solution. Uh, indeed, identified up to 40 per cent of spend uh, within the public sector was on prevention, um, which, uh, which could be uh, reduced, uh, sorry, was on, on cure rather than prevention, which could be reduced uh, with a focus on preventative measures in a much more structured way. So look at it in that sense, that number dwarfs anything else we talk about in budget discussions and clearly gives much to go at if this is approached in a correct and structured way. Um, second point I want to raise is around about the art of the possible. Um, and uh, it's often uh, the case you lose sight of this in, uh, in, in arguments around about numbers and, and budgeting processes and so on. But it's instructive to reflect back on the COVID experience um, and not to lose sight of the fact that uh, that showed for all the challenges and difficulties and, uh, and hurt that that uh, we went through in the pandemic. It showed that of the possible in terms of what partnership working could deliver, what could happen in terms of turning up the dial on speed and making things happen very, very quickly and very efficiently when, uh, when we had to. So I think it's important we don't lose sight of that and I, and I worry that we have to a large extent lost, uh, lost sight of that and that, as I say, of, uh, of the possible. We need to accept through the culture that things can be different um, and I think that culture change is absolutely central to taking forward a meaningful public sector reform agenda and recognising that government's role is to enable that change, but also very much to lead, to lead by example in the bits that government does have control of to make them as efficient um, and as effective as it is possible. And I fear that often isn't uh, the approach that, uh, that we take. A structured change management process in a complex organisation, which is what this is, and those of us who have experience of doing that in other environments, recognise that it's not ad hoc or piecemeal. It needs to have um, a very clear process that's followed through. And it's also not a big top-down change. That's expensive, it's time-consuming, and it also goes against the Christie principle of empowerment. And I think the Tory amendment falls into that trap of asking for a, a complete review of everything, something that would take many, many years, cost a lot of money, and not deliver very much at the end of it. No, it's much more about creating that environment, simplifying the landscape, recognising that complexity is the enemy. Um, we now have 129 public bodies on the list. I've not checked how many there were in 2011 when Christie was published. It might be instructive to have a look at that and see what, what the direction of travel is uh, in that regard and whether we're making progress or indeed going backwards uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. Um, clarity on accountability is critical. Um, we start from a good place. We have a very effective and, and well-documented well uh, national performance framework um, which lays out what it is we're trying to deliver and whether we're making progress on it. Um, but uh, without that clarity of who's responsible for what, right through the system, then you fall into the trap of something that is everybody's responsibility. It becomes nobody's responsibility. And if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. Indeed, I will. 
Stephen Kerr. But Ivan McKee agreed that the issue, the point he's raised about the cluttering, the cluttering, that all these different bodies, that hardly helps with clear lines of accountability. And isn't that just a fact of organisational life? Ivan McKee. I think that's exactly the point I was making. Um, the next point is around about empowerment um, and listening to frontline staff and, of course, the public, the service users. Um, and recognising the power of micro-improvements, that culture of continuous improvement, because often we think that things can, as I said, be imposed from top down, taking a, a long period of time because the big bang is the best solution. Um, a, a culture where staff feel empowered to make those changes on the ground on a daily basis, and where the public feel empowered to raise those issues uh, where they see service delivery not working effectively and in a joined up way is hugely important. Too often, unfortunately, in the public sector, in my experience, the culture is a system knows best best, um, be that the management system or indeed the computer system, and we've seen in recent days and weeks the, the damage that that can cause when uh, something is taken forward that doesn't obviously pass the common sense test and, and people didn't step in to, to, to blow the whistle on those, uh, those problems with the post office. Um, it's really important to remember that poor public service delivery makes inequality much worse. Point has already been made in the debate. Uh, making public services excellent and more efficient um, is the best way to tackle inequality. The middle classes, frankly, will always fear, fear find a way around poor public services. It's uh, those who are uh, most challenged economically who will fail, unfortunately, to do so. And it's important that we recognise that uh, delivering effective and efficient public services, as I say, is the best way to tackle that in inequality. Vested interests, of course, exist. Um, the approach needs to be not to ignore them, but to identify them, align them where possible, or frankly tackle them where necessary, and not to use them as an excuse for, uh, for poor delivery. A few um, practical things in my closing remarks, presiding officer. Um, duplication exists. We recognise that, um, but there are not mechanisms in place to allow um, that to, to be brought together and to be driven out of the system across government and multiple agencies working in the same environment. A mechanism to do that is hugely important. Collab uh, consolidation of estates has been mentioned by the Deputy First Minister, and, and I welcome the focus that is getting. Um, it's disappointing, I would say, to some extent, that the Glasgow Hub has been taking forward a, 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 an investment, I think, that's wholly unnecessary, given the, the, the significant surplus of uh, estate there already is across the wider public sector in Glasgow. And I think getting the local authority, other agencies and government to bang their heads together and talk about what they actually have in terms of spare capacity means we could probably not need uh, that hugely expensive Glasgow, Glasgow Hub, which is a, 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 a pet project of, of, of many within the, within the civil servant service, unfortunately. Um, Digitisation, and, and on that regard, um, I'd see no progress, or maybe there is government, the Minister can let us know, on the, the, the opportunity to make use of the spare capacity, 80% empty Victoria Quay for uh, supporting business, uh, culture and technology development in that part of Edinburgh. Um, Digitisation is hugely important, but really important to recognise, again, it's not a big bang solution. Again, harking back to uh, the, the, the post office experience, part of the solution, very important to deliver it, but only part of, uh, of what needs to be a wider culture uh, and management uh, and a process change. Um, and finally, uh, 10 years is a long, long time. Uh, I feel that that, uh, that time frame creates complacency and people can afford to kick the can down the road. Um, the COVID response, as I said, shows what is possible in short time frames, be able to drive change on an ongoing basis with quarterly results. So a lot in that, uh, in that short time, presiding officer, uh, uh, and as always, very happy to engage with the ministers to add value to those uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Uh, and I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by John Mason. Well, it's always a pleasure actually to follow Ivan McKee because he's somebody on the SNP benches that I actually have an enormous respect for, and I say that sincerely. He is someone who has led organisations, who has led and managed businesses. So when he talks about culture and transformation, I think it's worthwhile that everyone in the chamber, especially the front bench for the government, listen to what he is saying. Um, I wanted to intervene on my colleague Sandesh Gulhani. I didn't realise there'd be so much time for the debate um, when, when my intervention uh, wasn't possible. But the point I wanted to make with him is the, the Greens today, Patrick Harvey today, is claiming credit for the widening tax gap between Scotland and England. There you go. So there's the SNP for you in this government. The Greens are claiming the credit uh, for that particular piece of nonsense. And I agree with Michael Mara. This is a government that has absolutely no appetite, absolutely no appetite for, for reform of any kind. Because uh, there can be no doubt that um, 
there is a serious need for reform in the Scottish public sector. But we are stuck, however, with this SNP Green Government that is never going to tackle the big issues because they just, just do not have the appetite for it. And the people who know this better than anyone else are the people that work in our public services. They come to their work every day frustrated by the stress of delivery failures that make their lives and the lives of the people that they serve worse. Now, Willie Rennie, I thought, was untypically, in his speech, he, he, he went after the government on the record, but, but I thought he was too generous. Because the fact is that this set of ministers, they, they lack the competence to deal with serious reform. And he didn't mention competence. They just can't do it. They haven't got it in them. It's all just too hard for this group of ministers. And, 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 and this is why so many of our public services, from the councils to the NHS, have, have turned inwards. Because now they're obsessed by how things are done, by a great morass of covering, uh, corporate governance. It's all about covering backs and finding new ways to refuse to do things. They've become obsessed with reputational protection and indeed PR. And this is the product of the mismanagement, the lack of leadership of the last 17 years by this SNP Green Government, which has compounded the decline of our public services that frankly started under Labour and the Liberal Democrat coalition of 20 years ago. And it's also why we've ended up with so much secrecy. Organisations have lost their candour. And nowhere is that more evident than the area of whistleblowing. Now, I want to make a, some serious remarks about whistleblowing because it's something that I think as a parliament we should take a lot more seriously. Because in March last year, we observed Whistleblower Awareness Week. We had a meeting in parliament attended by parliamentarians from every party bar one, including members who are present in the chamber this afternoon. And we listened together so whistleblowers tell their stories, public sector whistleblowers tell their stories, and it was a traumatic experience for those telling the stories, but also for all of us listening. It was raw, it was authentic, and it was distressing. Uh, presiding officer, whistleblowing is a public good. We should hold those who whistleblow in high esteem. They are actually heroes who uphold the public good, but too often, Management sees them as some sort of an affront to the organisation and its reputation. They deal with the whistleblower as a problem to be solved, rather than addressing the issue that the whistleblower has raised. HR procedures and legal devices are thrown at the whistleblower because they had the temerity in the first place to raise their hand and point out a genuine concern. And there are many examples of mistreatment of whistleblowers in the Scottish public sector services. Nobody in this parliament should assume a superior attitude about the treatment of whistleblowers in any branch of Scotland's public services. In NHS Scotland, there are cases of grotesque victimisation, the, the misuse of executive authority. We have health boards where we know there have been widespread cases of bullying. In one health board, senior clinicians have retired and left the service because they felt they were asked to do things that were unethical, being subject to what some called emotional blackmail, which caused them in turn to suffer extreme mental stress. In one case that I am aware of, a senior clinician took his own life. Such was the horrendous experience that he was enduring. In Police Scotland, there have been outrageous examples of misogyny in the way that women police officers, highly professional, accomplished women, have been dealt with by the senior officers. Police officers have been bullied because they raise concerns about their safety and the inappropriate behaviour of other officers. The culture in our education system also leaves a lot to be desired. I can't tell you how many teachers I have spoken to who have said they fear speaking up about what is really happening in the classrooms of our country because they then feel that their careers will effectively be ended. They get marked out as troublemakers. And when they raise concerns about what is happening in the schools in terms of school discipline, their ability as teachers is questioned. When they do speak out, their comments are ignored, deliberately struck out or withheld from the minutes of meetings. They become marked. It is career inhibiting, if not career ending. And this is but the tip of the iceberg. People who have come forward to serve 
in the NHS, in, in the police, or in our schools deserve our respect and they deserve our support. They need to know that this Parliament has their interests at heart. Those who come forward with issues should be thanked and listened to, not sidelined and mistreated. They should not be threatened with legal sanction, harassed or blackmailed for their efforts. And members of this Parliament will know, they will have been told and they will have seen that far too many people, for far too many people in our public services, this is their experience. We owe it to the people who work in public service to have an honest conversation about the culture that they experience in the workplace. And that, I think, is in large measure, I took from Ivan McKee's speech. Culture is where we need to start. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. You might want to change things with strategic ideas, with visions, with objectives, but if the culture is not right, none of that progress will be realised. And we owe it to the taxpayers of this country who feel they are being shortchanged by the services that they expect to receive when they need to use them, to speak up on their behalf. It is time, presiding officer, for us to establish an independent office of the whistleblower sitting outside of any of the public services. An arm's length entity, answerable to this parliament, a safe harbour for whistleblowers, somewhere they can go in confidence and be treated with respect and have their concerns listened to and addressed as appropriate. Public service begins with a transformation of organisational culture towards a culture of transparency and candour. And that transformation begins with the creation of an environment in which every employee's opinion and concerns Mr. are not Kerr, only could you noted, please bring your remarks to a close? Thank uh, you. I will. Are not only noted but respected and acted upon. In conclusion, the people working in our public services know how to fix the service delivery problems that they experience every day of their working lives. What we need is transparency and accountability. Those are the values that we should be reinforcing. Thank, thank you, through Mr. Kerr. Thank you. I've been conclude? very generous with I, the time, Mr. Kerr. I, I have been very but, generous. But, but, thank you, Mr. Kerr. No, thank you. I'm order. now going to call the next speaker. No, thank but, you very much. Point of order, Mr. Kerr. I had the important uh, addition to make to my remarks. Uh, Mr. That, Kerr, please resume your seat for a second. Thank you very much. Further to your point of order, I had said that I wanted you to bring your remarks to a close. You continued and continued, and then I had to intervene to effect that very result because I have to protect other speakers' speaking time as well. You had, Mr Kerr had a very generous allocation above his six minutes, and I think we've heard the general gist of Mr Kerr's points put extremely well. A further point of order, Mr Kerr. I have to declare that members should refer to my register of interests because I am, the, I am the director of a, a not-for-profit company, Whistleblowers UK, and it's important that that's put on the record. And perhaps, if you'd allow me to say it, it would have been done and dusted long ago. Uh, well, that could have been said during the member's speech, but it is, now on, it is now on the record, and I think it is time to move on to the next speaker, who I'm sure the Chamber would all very much wish to hear. Mr Mason, to be followed by Mr Rowley. Well, th thank you, presiding officer, for your kind uh, words. I was waiting quite a long time for uh, Mr Kerr to finish. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I think uh, there is probably a lot we can agree on, uh, including the three key missions of equality, opportunity and community, uh, as well as ensuring public services remain fiscally sustainable, improving outcomes and reducing inequalities of outcome among communities in Scotland. But the challenge is, how do we go about all of that? One of the themes is certainly around the area one of my themes is certainly around the area of could we reduce the number of organisations in Scotland. Now, one of the advantages surely we have of being a smaller country is that we should be able to do things with simpler structures and fewer organisations. And that is why I have a concern about the growing number of commissions or commissioners, and the Finance Committee is to carry out an inquiry into this. And I note that uh, Mr Kerr wanted to add yet another. I note in the Government's response to the Finance Committee at paragraph 114 that they have an assumption against new public bodies, and my hope is that the Parliament will also take this approach. We have already brought police under one body, as has been mentioned already, and fire and rescue, and there has been recent discussion about health boards and the suggestion that they could be reduced to three, and I just wonder if we could even reduce them to one. 
but that's just a question. And also the idea of single island authorities sounds very attractive to me. We had long needed better integration between health boards and councils, and the health and social care partnerships or integrated joint boards have moved that programme forward. But on the other hand, it has meant that where we had two organisations previously, now we have three. And one of my fears when I first heard about the National Care Service Bill was that we were going to end up with four. Again, I would say Scotland is a small country. We have the opportunity to do things more simply. So definitely yes to more integration and partnership working, but surely no to more and more organisations. The motion mentions prevention and early intervention, and I think we're all supportive of that. Policies like the 1140 hours of early learning and childcare are a good example of that. If we can support children and families better in the early years, then it is highly likely that outcomes will be better later on. I would suggest that the fire service has also been a success story with fewer fires and less loss of life through fires because of so much good preventative work. However, it has to be said that we have struggled to achieve major changes in the health sector. There continues to be a major focus on hospitals and secondary care, including ambulance delays and waiting times at A&E, which are all important. But we tend to lose focus on GPs and other parts of the primary health care and preventative side. And in turn, a lot of that depends on finances. If we had a, budget, a, a period with budget surpluses, then we could invest more in preventative spending. But when budgets are tight, as they are at the moment, it is difficult to disinvest in hospitals and switch the money to community spending instead. The Finance Committee, which includes public administration in its remit, has been looking at public service reform. We had thought the government was going to set out clear targets for reducing the number of public sector workers, but it has seemed more recently that each organisation within the public sector will have to reform itself within its own budget limits. That approach leaves each body to manage a trade-off between what staff numbers it can afford and what pay increases it can afford. But as we have also heard at the Finance Committee, the previous police boards and fire boards would not have amalgamated into Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue without clear leadership and direction from the Scottish Government and from Parliament. Again, the committee had expected more detail about future years along with the publication of this year's budget. However, I now understand we are due to get that in May when we get the new medium-term financial strategy. Going forward, there is the ongoing challenge of whether to provide support and benefits universally or to target those who need support the most. Again, we have looked at this to some extent at the Finance Committee and especially it was raised at our public engagement session in Largs in August. It seems to me there is broad acceptance that school education and the NHS should be free to all at the point of use, and perhaps that is partly because they have been around for so long. Ideally, if we had enough money, I would like to see most services being universal, with no need for means testing or targeting. But money is tight right now, and I do think that we need to target those most in need. For example, the retail and hospitality sector have been asking for NDR relief, and more like the system in England. However, some parts of that sector are doing extremely well and have no need for such support. Therefore, I do think the Scottish Government's approach of targeting those most in need, including small businesses and businesses in islands, is the right one. Of course, even that is not perfect and there will be anomalies. But I do think it is better than providing no support at all on the one hand or support across the board, which is not always needed and which is unaffordable. But public service reform is only part of the answer. Going forward, we need to try and engage the wider public in debate as to what public services they want and how much they are willing to pay. Now, public services can be provided by the public sector, but also by the private sector or the third sector. And I was taken by the briefing from Social Enterprise Scotland for today's debate, making the point that there is room to look at new models and to democratise public bodies, for example, ScotRail and Scottish Water, by having customers and employees on their boards. Some workers in the private sector provide an excellent public service, for example, postmen and postwomen going beyond the call of duty by checking up on older people, reducing isolation and similar. Bus drivers can be incredibly helpful with people who do not have good English or are unfamiliar with an area. So in conclusion, I do very much agree that we need to emphasise values as we look at the public sector reform, but I do also think we should not be afraid of being radical and of taking a long-term view as to what is best for Scotland. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To say I was flabbergasted when I read the Government's motion for this debate today would be an understatement. I would have to say the SNP are either in denial or they are completely delusional about the state of Scotland's economy and public services. I believe it is clear to anyone in this country who has been paying attention that Scotland is in a worse state now than it was when the SNP took power 16 years ago. So I think it is completely ironic but predictable that this SNP government has decided to bring MSPs to this chamber today to request congratulations for the dire state of Scotland's public services. I have no doubt, with the support of their partners, the Greens, this motion of self-congratulation will be passed here today. But I would say the only people they are fooling is themselves. The majority of people in Scotland will not be fooled as they have witnessed the deterioration of their public services firsthand, so they know how disingenuous this motion is. Just yesterday, I read in The Scotsman the words of Dr Leah Peel, an A&E doctor working in Glasgow, who said that the last thing she would want is for any of her loved ones to be in A&E. She said, and I quote, to put it into perspective, imagine your granny or another elderly relative needing to go into A&E. You will call the ambulance. That ambulance is going to take longer to come out. Then they're going to sit in that ambulance outside of A&E for however many hours. And they're going to eventually come in and they might sit in a corridor for however many hours. And then they'll get seen by a doctor. And then they'll be waiting on a trolley for another however many hours. So back to the self-congratulatory motion. How does that equate to success in health? Dr John Paul Lowry, Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicines, said at some emergency departments in Scotland, only 20% of patients are seen within the Scottish Government's four-hour wait targets, adding that many NHS workers are looking for exit plans as people are leaving shifts in tears. What impact will this have on our already short-staffed and exhausted NHS workforce who are shouldering the repercussions of this government's failure of workforce planning? And what impact will this have on my constituents who are already having difficulty accessing medical care that they need or the one in six Scots who are currently on ever-increasing waiting lists. Also yesterday, I read that over the past six years, the number of elderly people who died while waiting for social care in Scotland has more than doubled. Donald McCaskill, the Chief Executive of Scottish Care, said, and I quote, I have lost count of the number of social care providers who have said that a service user was supposed to come in but they died. He went on, it is an unforgivable scandal that people are not experiencing the quality of life that they could. He added that shortages of staff to perform assessments was likely behind the increase in deaths, as was, as he put it, the fact there seemed to be a total inadequacy of resources going into social care. Yet this government seems to believe that their proposals for a national care service, nothing more than a centralised procurement system that further removes power from the underfunded local authorities and has been widely condemned by key stakeholders, is the answer to these issues. An answer that is currently not scheduled to arrive until 2029, halfway through the next parliament. In this, the ambitious public service reform that the Scottish Government believes should be supported in today's motion. Unless the region I represent is uniquely unlucky, I am confident that the Cabinet Secretary's inbox 
and those of her colleagues are increasingly overwhelmed, much like mine, with contact from constituents desperately trying to access public services that are similarly overwhelmed or simply non-existent. How does the Cabinet Secretary explain to those struggling with access to public services across Scotland that the SNP Green Government think they are doing a great job? It is clear that this Government has spent 16 years engaged in short-term thinking for long-term problems, with the full extent of its ambitious reform proposals boiling down to little more than centralisation and budget cuts. I believe people up and down Scotland are desperate for a change in approach, a change in attitude and a change in focus. And if we are to deliver the public service reform Scotland so desperately needs, ultimately the people of Scotland need a change in government. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I now call Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Cara Mochan. Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm pleased to be contributing in today's debate on Scotland's public sector values. Um, there is no doubt um, Scotland's public sector are currently navigating one of the most challenging financial climates since devolution began. The impact of inflation, the tragic conflict in Ukraine and a severe cost of living crisis have exposed Scotland's public services to significant economic vulnerabilities, exacerbated by harsh Tory austerity choices and a hard Brexit. And Brexit really has been devastating. According to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, the real GDP of the UK has decreased by a staggering 2 to 3 per cent. And in the year 2023 alone, Scotland experienced a reduction in devolved spending power amounting to around 1.6 billion. A substantial consequence for a decision that voters in every local authority area um, across Scotland rejected. President officer, despite challenging circumstances, Scotland fights to remain resilient, and there are some positives. We've heard many negatives today already. The attainment gap for literacy is closing for our primary school learners. Unemployment is at 3.8 per cent, and our core A&E facil facilities have consistently outperformed others in the UK for the past eight years. And I certainly take pride in our Scottish Government's unwavering commitment to prioritise public services in stark contrast to the UK Tory Government's approach cutting taxes at the expense of public services. President officer, the Verity House Agreement marks a significant step towards achieving optimal outcomes for our citizens and empowers local government to use its wealth of local knowledge to enhance the delivery of our public services. With increased empowerment over local decisions and the introduction of legislation like the visitor levy and council tax premiums, local authorities will have greater autonomy to generate revenue to meet local needs. Yes. Stephen Kerr. Well, thank, thank the member for giving way. What does Stephanie Callan say to the local authority leaders that I've spoken to who say that the Verity House Agreement is not worth the paper it's written on? Stephanie Callan. I thank the member for that intervention, um, but to be fair, that's certainly not the evidence that we're hearing that committee directly from them. Mm -hmm. And I've lost my place now. This collaborative effort between national and local government, operating within a shared framework and aligned policies, only enhances their capacity to deliver sustainable and person-centred public services. While this will continue to be challenging, keeping the needs of our citizens at the core of this shared partnership and at the core of what we're thinking will be the key to success. President officer, the third sector, or maybe more accurately, the community and voluntary sector, plays a pivotal role in delivering public services. Yet its contribution is sometimes overlooked. When I met recently with the Chief Exec at Voluntary Action North Lanarkshire, their evidence, sorry, my tablet is jumping around. <laughs> their emphasis on the big wins for small investments in the sector resonated deeply with me. The contributions of the community and voluntary sector include the crucial role in priming our economy for growth by providing essential skills, workplace training and delivering high quality services in health, social care, education and more. This sentiment is reinforced by the economic contribution of the Third Sector in Scotland report published by the Royal Society Edinburgh, which hails the sector as a significant player in the Scottish economy. Social enterprises have also played their part 
and in 2021 they provided nearly 90,000 full-time equivalent jobs and £2.6 billion in gross value added to the Scottish economy. However, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and others have suggested that clarity on whether social enterprises are classed as third sector would be helpful as we consider public service reform going forward, and it would be good to have a comment on that. I want to talk about a local example, Morfit Gentle Movement. They're based in Hamilton. Lanarkshire delivers inclusive exercise plans and lifestyle interventions for those who would otherwise struggle to access exercise at all. Morfit focuses on supporting the ageing population, those experiencing isolation and those caring for others, and they receive referrals from the local GPs and health and social care partnerships, amongst others. They support up to 60 individuals every week, and they've built a real community that's expanded into arts and other projects, and residents tell me very regularly that it's been absolutely life-changing for them. And it's this person-centred delivery that really makes a difference in people's lives. And I really think it's imperative that we provide sustained, sustained support for third sector organisations and uphold their recognition as not just service providers, but as integral sources of positive social and wealth generation. Presiding officer, it will come as no surprise to anyone that I support Scottish independence. And we've heard a lot of negatives today and we've heard a lot of urgency to spend more money. But where is it that money is actually going to come from? Now, some might be surprised that I didn't vote SNP until 2015, after decades of voting Labour, voting for the Labour Party. But my principles and values have always been rooted in social justice, including our duty to look after each other, respect others as equals, and value our local communities. And this chimes with the three key Scottish Government delivery priorities, equality, opportunity, and community. And while Scottish independence is often portrayed as being about flag-waving, nationality, and dislike in England, that is not my experience at all. For myself and many like me, independence is all about creating a Scotland that looks after everyone who lives here from cradle to grave. And it's only by the powers of independence that we can fully unleash the talents and the resources that will allow industry to thrive and truly invest in those precious public services that uphold Scottish citizens' rights and prioritise happiness and wellbeing. That's the kind of Scotland I want to live in. And, President Officer, I'll close with a recent quote from, the Scot uh, from Scotland's First Minister that I couldn't agree with more. Independence is urgent precisely because living standards are top of people's concerns. Thank you. I call Carol Mockin to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, can I start by paying tribute to our public sector workforce, from the NHS to schools, fire services and all our public sector workers. They deserve our praise, but more than that, they deserve a government prepared to meet the promises they have made and that treat them with respect. And this motion does not do this. Can I also speak directly to our communities who are being let down? I understand it is them who suffer long waits within our health service, cannot access community facilities, or see no future in the education system. It is our communities who suffer as this mess just deepens and deepens. We need action, and that action needs to work for both our communities and our dedicated workforce. Now, before uh, my colleagues in the centre be benches start to jump up and down at me, I would want to make this point. I am no friend of the Tories. I believe the chaos created by Truss and Johnson on top of the constant Tory attack on working class people means they have undoubtedly contributed to a raid on our public purse. However, to be clear, our job in this place is not to deflect, not to just blame, it is to deliver to deliver on commitments made and services required. And the reality is, if we do not reflect on our own actions, our own contributions to the problem, we will never seek to find the solution. We just absolve ourselves of the responsibility. The reality is, this tired government, as it enters its 18th year, must be prepared to acknowledge its failures. Currently, it just grasps its straws, trying to build a set of values, as it's described, out of the wreckage of Scotland's public services. The motion from the government feels like it is about dressing up brutal cuts in the language of reform and values. It's about window dressing rather than substance. And I think if we are absolutely honest, everyone in this chamber knows it. 
even those, let me make progress if you don't mind, even those on the government benches. We have had this for 17 years. No priority given. I give way to the gentleman. Alistair Allen. Hey, and she talks about some of the, the pressures on, on Scotland's budget. I wonder if she can explain, is she anticipating an incoming UK Labour government would continue to uh, hold to its plans to stick to Tory spending priorities for the first two years? Carol Mockin. Thank you. I thank the member for uh, his intervention. I think you'll know from the words that I speak in this chamber, I expect, I expect delivery for our communities, and that is what I expect from a Labour government. If we strip away the spin and you can sense what really lies in store here in Scotland, funding cuts for the whole public sector and considerable job losses across Scotland. The government want to focus the debate on what someone else has done, but they need to face up to their lack of long-term planning, lack of leadership and lack of decision-making. We have heard in the debate today the Finance and Public Administration Committee have been critical of the Scottish Government's lack of strategy and leadership in the area of public sector reform. In its pre-budget report, it stated that the focus of the Scottish Government's public service reform programme since 2022 changed multiple times, uh, as has the timescale for publishing further details on that programme. Um, the multiple changes and lack of decision making is a common theme for this government and is undeniably a problem for Scotland and its communities. It leads to anxiety, a lack of productivity, a country that looks to be in decline rather than surging into a new year with confidence and purpose. And that lies at the door of this SNP government. Over the last year, I have spoken to workers in every part of our public sector, local government, colleges, NHS staff, emergency services, school teachers and more. Conjuring up new public service values is of little comfort to them. What they need is investment, leadership and to see the work that they do valued through proper planning, proper investment and pay. If I talk to constituents, they say the same. Can I make progress, please? If I speak to constituents, they say the same. They see a lack of investment in the public sector, particularly in their communities. They see a government which is not capable of tackling NHS waiting lists or reducing the attainment gap. I would take a short intervention. Just, uh, thanks for, the, for giving uh, me the opportunity to, to ask about the point you've just mentioned on pay. Would the member not recognise that that we have delivered quite, quite rightly the, the pay deals that are deserved by our public sector workforce, but actually in, in advance of any other pay deals anywhere else in these islands, would the member not recognise that? That's an important part of investment in our public services, investment in pay beyond anything seen anywhere else in these islands. Carol Mockin. Thank you. I mean, it's, it, it's what I expected from, from uh, the Cabinet Secretary. And what I would say is I have spent hours, hours on picket lines in Scotland. So don't pretend that we have a comprehensive plan of where we're going. I accept and I will accept good pay uh, and pay increases for all of our public sector workers. But let's be honest about some of the other stuff that we have to do. And that if we think of the college uh, sector, you know, we're nowhere near where we should be in that. So now the reality is we cannot have a debate uh, like this without talking about local government and I don't have much time but the government's disdain for local government is in plain sight and that has to be overcome. Um, the, the Verity Agreement that has been spoken about, we know that the councils and COSLA are concerned about it and they spoke about the budget as it stands leaves not a single penny for transformative public sector reform. There is very limited scope for a focus on spend to save. And one thing the Deputy Minister has um, been unable to do is really give uh, the, the, the councils or the trade unions any idea of where these cuts that we've spoken about is. In closing, presiding officer, officer, I ask this government to speak less about values and consider, consider more closely what value they are providing voters who stood by them for a number of elections only to be left with public services that are at the brink of collapse. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a, a useful debate for us to have heading into the second half of this Parliament, particularly in the current financial context. Public sector reform shouldn't just be based on affordability, but we can't ignore the fact that budget availability is one of the deciding factors in our decision making. 
I am a fan of a big state. I think government should be the expression of the popular will of society. It is where we share power and resources to do transformational things, in particular to protect our most vulnerable neighbours and our planet. Big challenges like the deeply embedded inequality present in the UK and the climate crisis require a big coordinated response of the kind which only government can lead. And I want to see a bigger state in Scotland doing more to meet, uh, meet the needs of people and planet. But I don't just want what we've got now on a bigger scale. We need far, far more efficient and accountable service provision. The kind of Scottish Government which Greens want to see would require a larger staff headcount, inevitably, for example. But we recognise that the level of output from the Scottish public sector over the last decade hasn't grown as much as the headcount. And that isn't a criticism of staff themselves. These are issues of structure, process and culture, not individual competence of civil servants and officials. That's very clear in the gap between intention and delivery identified by Audit Scotland. We're good at ambition, every party, but it's far easier than delivery, so that's not a surprise. Whether it's councils, government, health boards or other public bodies, we all recognise that delivery, whilst rarely as bad as made out uh, in debates in here or in sections of the press, certainly isn't always meeting our aspirations. And there's no singular solution to that, but I'd suggest that the following would help. Firstly, a rebalancing of resources from the Scottish Government centrally to its agencies and public bodies. We won't solve the delivery challenge by under-resourcing those responsible for delivery. Pulling resources into the centre because agencies are perceived to have failed or be unreliable is understandable, which is why governance reform and clear ministerial direction for public bodies is critical. More resources alone for bodies which are not delivering is rarely going to be the solution and in some cases will just be counterproductive. I think we've heard enough from Mr Kerr. Thank you very much. In some areas, funding isn't actually the issue at all. Take the SQA, a body which has failed to deliver what we would all expect of it. The issues there relate to governance and culture. The Education Reform Bill, which will replace the SQA with a new qualifications body, will be one of the most important in this session. It is critical that the weaknesses in the SQA's current governance structures and culture are not replicated by the new body. We can't see a repeat of a board with just one current teacher but three management consultants. Corporate governance skills are important, but at the SQA and some other public bodies, we are getting the balance wrong, leaving the boards with inadequate understanding of the policy areas which their organisation is responsible for, which I suggest is leading to their being unable to effectively scrutinise the decisions those bodies are making and the way in which they are discharging their duties. Yes. Michael I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Mr Gu in terms of his assessment of the SQA. Does he not think that we are now three years on from the fiasco of the exams uh, disgrace that happened to young people in this country? We were told at the time this would be scrapped. And actually, the, the, the motion we have from the government today runs directly counter to the track record of getting this work of reform done. Yeah, yeah. Ross Greer. I understand entirely Mr. Uh, Mr. Mara's desire to see that work take place as quickly as possible. I'll come on to later the fact that there's a tension, though, between ensuring that we're undertaking good quality work, particularly legislative work, and the need to, to do so at pace, and particularly when we are abolishing a body as significant as the SQA and replacing it, I think it's right that the Cabinet Secretary has decided to take the time to consult with the workforce directly. I've mentioned before my belief that the new qualifications body I think would be better served by a board which includes a substantial number of current teachers and lecturers as well as students, parent and carers representatives, children's rights experts and others. And I think if that had been the case with the SQA, I sincerely doubt we would have ended up in the appalling situation where the Equality and Human Rights Commission had to take enforcement action after discovering that no equality impact assessment had been conducted for who knows how long. The other key element to successful replacement of the SQA is an overhaul of its organisational uh, and specifically its management culture. The SQA has developed a deserved reputation for hostility to question and challenge, particularly from teachers. The structure of the new organisation can address this, in part by baking in consultation and co-design processes, discussion forums and a range of other mechanisms. But just creating the space doesn't guarantee that you'll fulfil that purpose, certainly not if the ivory tower culture of SQA management transfers over. Considerable work was done at the point of establishing Social Security Scotland to ensure it had the right organisational culture. And I think that approach or something similar should be taken to the reform processes on, uh, taking place in this session 
of Parliament. One other success story, which I don't think we talk about enough in Parliament, is Screen Scotland. It was set up as a unit within Creative Scotland, and it's had a transformational effect. Ten years ago, our film and TV professionals were embarrassed by the state of the sector. Now we have world-class studios, which are booked out and turning business away. The value of film and TV to our economy doubled from 2019 to 2021. The sector is employing record numbers of people in a vast range of roles, and our international reputation is rapidly growing. And the team at Screen Scotland have been absolutely critical to that. I th still think that further reform there is required, maybe an independent body from Creative Scotland, but the success of establishing that screen unit is an example we should look to in other cases of public sector reform. I don't have too much time left, so I'll raise through a, a few more points. I've mentioned the importance of consultation and co-design. As I said to Mr Mara, I think there's a challenge here between the demand on public bodies to be more nimble in responding to change and the need to actually uh, take uh, the time required to make the correct uh, decision. I do think, though, that sometimes just explaining why a process is what it is and why it's taking so long is sometimes all that's needed to maintain stakeholder buy-in, at least for a time. And briefly, we need to see far more collaboration, starting with the basics of sharing data. The David Hume Institute reckons that our economy loses £2 billion every year as a result of public data in Scotland not being accessible. The government and a handful of councils operate open government licences. I've persuaded two more councils and four colleges to adopt it, but I think others need to do the same. I think we need to ask why we have an ethical standards commissioner and a standards commission when one body could fulfil both of those roles and save on operating costs. I'm completely unconvinced by the argument that merging councils is a solution to anything when they already feel so remote to the communities that they serve, though sharing services has potential. And I'm concerned by the constant suggestions that the NHS needs fewer managers when it's already undermanaged compared to many other healthcare systems. Clinicians already do too much admin, so getting rid of more admin support won't help with that, even if it makes for easy headlines. President officer, I think we should make more time for debates like this on a regular basis. It's a key topic that cuts across every portfolio and it affects the lives of everyone in Scotland. This afternoon we had the opportunity to begin scratching the surface of what more radical and substantive reform could look like. Some members took up the opportunity to do so, sadly others did not, and I still am completely unclear as to what the opposition's alternatives are to any of the reform programmes that the government is taking forward, but I would welcome the opportunity for us to have more debates on public sector reform form on a regular, at the very least, an annual basis for the rest of this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Ruth Maguire, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate on the importance of continued investment in delivering and reforming public services for Scotland's people and communities. Whilst things have undoubtedly been challenging for quite some time, in fact, since the beginning of Tory austerity over a decade ago, it's clear that the economic damage of Brexit, which means up to £3.7 billion of potential funding for our public services, has been lost, has piled on additional pressure. And much like the austerity agenda, is the result of a political choice, one of course that the majority of Scottish citizens voted against. In speaking to the Scottish Government's motion and legacy of successful public service reform in recent years, including Health and Social Care Partnerships and Social Security Scotland, I want to be clear that whilst outcomes have improved for many people and communities, particularly um, in terms of the absolute focus that so Social Security Scotland has in treating people with dignity and respect, something that's been transformational and that all parties in this, in this Parliament contributed to, one person not having their rights realised in this country is one too many. And we all of us need to focus on the policy implementation gap that's clear in several areas. The slightly hyperbolic rhetoric from some opposition colleagues might have you thinking our country is in absolute tatters. That's both untrue and unhelpful when seeking to reform services. But it'd be equally unhelpful to close our eyes to the very real challenges our public services are facing and the impact that that has on many of our vulnerable citizens. Colleagues on the Education, Children and Young People Committee saw a stark illustration of that with regards to our disabled children and young people. Of course, as with everything, there are pockets of excellent practice, but it's not good enough that the rights of any children and young people are not being realised. Colleagues across the Chamber will also be aware of the numbers of people in their constituency who are not receiving their full entitlement of social care, care that's crucial to sustain them in a dignified manner in their own homes. Health and social care integration was absolutely the right thing to do, 
And again, there are pockets of excellent practice and a skilled, committed workforce doing their very best, work that makes the lives of citizens better. However, there's much to learn from what's not worked as well. For the proposed National Care Service to succeed, there must be clarity on what about its structure will mean for, from the perspective of those who are entitled to the services, not the organisations or the professionals. Clarity on things like how a disabled citizen assessed as requiring additional support in their home to be healthy and thrive will actually get it. And clarity in how a citizen returning to their home from a serious operation will have the adaptations done that they've been assessed as needing by a professional to ensure they're safe, completed in a timely manner. It's no exaggeration to see that those matters that I raised there are matters of life and death. My constituents will also want to be clear on whether key local services should be delivered on a project basis. Services like mental health support for vulnerable young people. Should boards be able to withdraw with no consultation, no equality impact assessment or transition arrangements in place? World-leading human rights-based approaches to policy and legislation are a wonderful thing to talk to. They're what we should be aspiring to, but they must be backed up by delivery and access to redress where rights are not realised. Further reform to public services will be necessary to ensure that public services remain fiscally sustainable and to improve outcomes for all Scotland's people and communities. Public sector workers are key to the success, and as I acknowledged earlier, they're doing an excellent job in some challenging circumstances. Showing how much we value them will mean continuing with fair pay and conditions. The government motion states that further reform will require to focus on prevention and early intervention, involve people in communities in design and embrace the power of digital technologies. As my colleague John um, Mason laid out, in terms of focus on prevention and early intervention, I think we all intuitively know that that's the right thing to do. We have also have screeds of evidence that that's the right thing to do for outcomes for people, and it's also the most cost-effective way to operate. But there's going to be required bravery to actually deliver that. Because investing additional resource in prevention and early intervention will often involve shifting resource from elsewhere. Difficult in times of abundance, even more challenging in the sort of fiscal environment we find ourselves in now. At the beginning of my remarks, I noted that political choices of austerity and Brexit made elsewhere that put our public services at risk. Choices that our citizens in Scotland did not vote for. Now, whatever constitutional arrangement Scotland has, there is a lot of work to do. But what is crystal clear to me is that until Scotland's independence is restored, we will always be at risk from political decisions made elsewhere. And with the amount of challenges our communities face, that's frankly heartbreaking. I agree, independence is urgent. Yep. Thank you. Then we move to winding up speeches, and I call on Paul Sweeney. Okay. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I have the pleasure of closing this debate for the Labour Party, the party, of course, that brought us the National Health Service, our Social Security system, and many other key pillars of our public services since the party first formed the government almost exactly a century ago on the 22nd of January. Uh, the main achievement of that first Labour government was, of course, the 1924 Wheatley Housing Act. This measure went some way towards rectifying the problem of the housing shortage caused by the disruption of the building trade during the First World War and the inability of working class tenants to rent decent, affordable housing. That Wheatley Act was able to provide public housing to council tenants as opposed to the previous government's privatisation agenda, and it subsidised the construction of over half a million homes at re controlled rents by the 1930s, when the subsidy for encouraging local authority housing was abolished by the Tories. And what do we have a century on in 2024 in the wake of a similar disruption, the pandemic? Housing emergencies in Scotland's two largest cities, a homelessness crisis, and a cut to the, cut to the country's capital budget for housing. A shameful indictment, a century on we have made little progress and indeed we are going backwards. The NHS is another great institution of our public service, the epitome, one might say, of public services. Yet this government has failed to give the people that give so much and has failed NHS patients too. Our healthcare professionals are happy to give way. Stephanie Callaghan. I 
thank the member for taking my intervention. I'm just wondering, he's mentioned in the NHS, he's talking about housing at a time in this country when the UK was actually on its knees. And I'm wondering if he would agree that perhaps Keir Stammer should be looking back at that point in time as well and looking to invest in this country should he become the next UK Prime Minister. Paul Sweeney. Well, I thank, I thank the member for that intervention. I think she makes a fair challenge, you know, inspired by the governments and previous, uh, previous Labour governments, you know, out of a century, Labour has only been in government for around 30 years. So the opportunity to serve, hopefully, as of the end of this year, will be significant. And I think the national missions that Labour has outlined will supercharge that effort. And indeed, we need to be bold, we need to be resilient, and we need to show the ambition necessary to dig ourselves out of this vicious cycle that the country has been in for far too long, certainly for my entire adult life. I don't want to be part of a generation that is poorer than its parents. We need to build out of that. And our healthcare professionals are similarly, they have no headroom right now. They're telling us this every day, that they're overstretched. Mental health services are at breaking point. Waiting times in need resulted in 1,600 excess deaths in Scotland last year, presiding officer. And astonishingly, the very principle of free at the point of need is no longer taken seriously, with almost one in six Scots on an NHS waiting list, some counted down the, 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 the days between having a treatable condition and a terminal condition. The SNP government have let down patients and the people that work in our National Health Service. The most glaring sign that NHS workers feel undervalued is the swathes of staff leaving, heading overseas. We have to not only retain staff, we have to grow the National Health Service workforce in Scotland. Labour will increase training places here in Scotland and aggressively, relentlessly focus on countering the reasons why we are failing to retain staff. Happy to give way if I can have the time Cabinet back. Secretary. I just wonder if he would at least acknowledge that NHS staff here in Scotland are the best paid anywhere in these islands. Would he acknowledge that? Paul Sweeney. Well, I think in relative terms, yes, but absolutely we still have a challenge here in Scotland, which is in absolute terms not working well because it's demonstrated in the workforce challenges we have. I think the, the Minister should recognise those challenges with a degree of humility because we're still not performing well enough because people are dying unnecessarily and that is not good enough. It's not good enough on our watch. Uh, and the member for Glasgow Province did uh, recognise some of those structural changes that we do need, uh, which are critical to any realistic change management programme, and I commend him for his speech. Uh, but as my friend Mr Rowley, the member from Mid-Scotland, uh, and Fife mentioned, the SNP government have neglected public services across the board for years. 16 years of SNP government and an abject failure to reform Scotland's public services mean that they are crying out for investment. Uh, my friend Ms Mockin from South Scotland highlighted the lack of focus, the lack of commitment, the lack of consistency that has characterised this government's programmes for many years. Indeed, it feels like a government focused on public relations rather than project management. And colleges was just one example that she cited. I find it, frankly, risible that this government's motion today claims that the Scottish Government continues to invest in delivering public services. When the Deputy First Minister set out the Scottish Government's budget just before Christmas from where I was sitting, it did not sound like a budget that was about promoting and advancing our public services. COSLA have since said that as a result of the proposed budget, there will be cuts in every community across Scotland and job losses in local government. Hardly the paragon of municipal socialism that characterised the first Labour government. If I, if I can have the time back, President Officer, yes. Cabinet Secretary. So the quantum available to us is clearly by and large dictated to the decisions of uh, uh, Whitehall spending departments and the quantum is the quantum. The only way to increase the quantum is through limited levers such as tax. Is it still the position of the Labour Party that you're against tax rises in order to raise those additional revenues? Because isn't that totally inconsistent then with the point that Paul Sweeney is just making? It's about actually having fiscal rules that are characterised by discipline. This government has been profligate with public expenditure. Let me, let me perhaps allude to the points made by the member for Glasgow Province that if you make capital investments that earn back income for the country. So one example might be colleges, for example. Colleges should be making money for the country, not losing money for the country. They should be selling training programmes to industry. They should be reinforcing our public services and stabilising our workforce challenges. This government seemingly doesn't seem capable of making those three-dimensional uh, calculations and structures when it delivers public policy. What we're seeing is a government characterised by draft players, not chess players. Uh, and indeed, the SNP spin here just does not cut the mustard. The disastrous budget fails to invest in public services and will leave councils at financial risk. It's just further evidence that communities across Scotland have been let down by the government. Slow economic growth means there's less money to spend in the public services than could have been built up to reform our public service. And if the Scottish economy had grown at the pace of the overall British economy since 2012, it would be £8.5 billion larger today. 
The Scottish Government must prioritise delivering economic growth across the country to ensure the National Health Service is not stuck in a permanent crisis and local councils are not left as cash strapped. And I go back to the member for Glasgow Province because I was taken with this speech. He made some really important points on the complex realities of undertaking a change management process whilst adhering to the Christie principle of empowerment and the need to ensure clear lines of accountability continuous improvement as well. We need micro and macro reforms. I could get into great detail. One example could be, for example, our efforts to recharge the commercial shipbuilding industry in Scotland, but that would require an entirely different speech. But listening to and empowering our staff, our workers on the front line, is essential to reform. And Mr Kerr, the Conservative member, certainly made that point about culture eating strategy for breakfast. So, presenting officer, the motion presented by the Deputy First Minister today is puzzling, it is devoid of reality and the humility that is a fundamental prerequisite of any reform programme. The Deputy First Minister says that the SNP are investing in public services, the budget slash public services left, right and centre. The spin does a disservice to thousands of public service workers who feel overstretched, undervalued and demoralised. Thank you. And I call on Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if I might, since this is the first debate in which I've participated uh, since the passing of our former Labour colleague Hanzala Malik, uh, begin with a tribute to him. Uh, because Hanzala Malik, when I saw today's subject uh, debate, public service values, was to me actually the epitome of a politician who uh, was one of the better public servants. He was a, a regular participant in what I call the graveyard shift, which is the Thursday afternoon debate. And he began every debate. Colleagues who served in the chamber will remember this by saying, good afternoon, presiding officer. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and he would then enter into uh, a spirited contribution. He was never pejoratively partisan. Uh, and I always felt that he had the interests of the people he served at the forefront of his concerns. He left here to serve again in council. He was immensely proud of his roots, of his community and of his family. Uh, and I shall always remember him with great affection. Um, can, I, can I then... Uh, yes, of course. Paul I, thank, I thank the member for giving way. Um, I want to just echo his fine tribute to the late Hans Alan Malik who I you know, greatly enjoy working with as a fellow representative of Glasgow, in particular tribute to him for his founding of the Glasgow City Heritage Trust, which I am now a trustee of, which does great work cross-party to protect Glasgow's built heritage. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Jackson it does Carlo. well to remember those of us who, with whom we've worked over time. Um, I'd like to just make a couple of reflections, uh, if I may. One is one of age, really, as, as I approach my late 60s. Um, and that is to reflect, as I came into politics, on the peer group that uh, motivated me were all men and women who'd served in the war um, or who had learned their experience uh, from those who had served in the war. And there was a real sense of duty uh, and public service that underpinned that. Uh, it was not just true of politics. It was true people went into the National Health Service. They'd seen the absolute worst of the world and they were determined to build the best of a new world thereafter. Uh, and I look now, and I don't want to be too generalised, um, and it's at that top level, whether it's in public life or whether it's in public service, that I sometimes wonder if it has the same moral authority that it had in that generation that I grew up in the wake of. Sometimes it seems to me that the moral authority now comes from those on the ground up, rather than from the top down. When I was undergoing a, a cancer biopsy just at the start of the um, COVID pandemic, um, nervous as I was, I was struck by the NHS staff who recognised who I was and asked if they could meet with me to say, we just want to let you know, Mr. Carlo, we will not let the country down. Uh, and I was very moved by that. Uh, uh, that kind of integrity and sense of purpose that comes from so many of those who work within our public services, which I think, to some extent, is let down now by the chiefs, because it seems to me too often they seek to defend the indefensible and to find ways around taking responsibility or being properly accountable for what happens. When I came into this parliament, um, I asked then what the, the NHS compensation bill was. Um, it, it had grown pretty quickly and we were all pretty appalled. It had gone from mm. 5 million up to 18.9 million pounds in 2007. 
In the most recent uh, figures, it wasn't £18.9 million. In the most recent year, it was £109.24 million in compensation. And it does seem to me that there is a reliance upon finding routes to absolve or to excuse responsibility than to take responsibility. And that the corrosive effect of that is that further down the line within our public services or within public life or anywhere, there are people who think, well, why, why should I bother? Why, why should I be making all of that effort if others are able to get away and to excuse themselves? And, and just before I take the intervention, can I say that that applies to politics too? So if you want to say to me, uh, what about Boris Johnson? Or you want to say to me, what about um, the junior doctors who seem to be leaders who I, I'm... Or you want to talk about Sir Ed Davey, or you want to talk about Sadiq Khan. I, all of these figures in public life have, I think, led to, beyond that, a sense among those people at the sharp end that they are there giving and showing the moral leadership, but it's not being reflected by those above them. Ruth McGuire. I, I appreciate Jackson Carlo giving me. I thought it was interesting remarks. I was not going to say any of those things. I wondered um, if more generally the, the dialogue that we have in politics and in the media prohibits that kind of honest reflection of leaders. I think sometimes our discourse contributes to that. Does he agree? Well, I, I can see Jackson time is such. I'm not going to be able to make much of a contribution in as, as wide as I wanted to this afternoon. But yes. You know, in the lead up to 2016, in that Parliament 2011 to 2016, do you know, I can recall we were very reluctant, very reluctant in this chamber to apply the word crisis to any of our public uh, services. When, when an MSP said that the NHS was in crisis, there was a general feeling around the chamber that we, we can't indulge in that sort of hyperbole. And yet in the decades since, um, I, I think we've kind of come to the view that there's a crisis in all our public services, whether it's education, policing, health. Uh, and it's not just here in Scotland. I mean, I, you know, let's be honest, it, it, it's in Wales, it's elsewhere too. Why? Because back in 2007 too, we also talked about the demographic changes that were coming in this country. Michael Mara reflected demographic changes, but sometimes we don't actually accept what that means. Because what it means is that we have an ageing population, a dramatically ageing population. And many of the benefits that this Parliament has decided to offer, rightly to people in Scotland, personal care, transport for, at 60, free tuition, free prescription charges, all of these mm. benefits actually cost even more with an expanding population who are going to draw and rely on them. An even bigger percentage of the population than was the case when these benefits were first introduced. And that has to be funded within the budget settlement that we have in Scotland, over and above all the other pressures that are applying to every other part of the United Kingdom. I'll take Alistair Allen. Alistair Allen. I, Alan. I thank you for giving me, and I thank the member for giving me, and also thank him for the, the very thoughtful, characteristically thoughtful uh, tenor of his remarks. He, he points to the demographic, grass, demographic, I beg your pardon, um, let's use the word crisis that Scotland uh, and other parts of Northern Europe face. It, does, it, does he also take the view that that must make us then think about what our policy is about freedom of movement within Europe and, and from elsewhere? I did, I did address the fact we had record migration into the UK uh, last year, but not to Scotland earlier. I, I suppose I want to conclude by saying I'd hope that this debate would be on a Thursday afternoon, one that could be more reflective. I thought the motion invited a more controversial and spirited debate. Uh, Mr. Mara very politely eviscerated the government. Mr. Rennie less politely eviscerated the government this afternoon. So it, it did get rather heated. But it seems to me that if you recognise that we have a hugely ageing demographic, if you recognise that these problems are common elsewhere, if you recognise that we have advanced additional public services here in Scotland, it's not a weakness of the government to accept after all these years that not everything is right or going right, and that if we are going to make progress, at some point, as Alec Neil once, when he was a Cabinet Secretary, recognised, 
It will require more of a collective understanding and acceptance of what our priorities are going to be and how we are going to address them. And that has to go beyond, I'm sorry, Mr. Greer, simply saying, I want a bigger state, I want an even bigger state, I want a larger staff headcount when it's only gone up by 55%, and really saying to people, you've never had it so rarely as bad as you think, which I think, to paraphrase Mr. Greer, is what he said. But let me, in closing, generously, if you'll allow me, Deputy Presiding Officer, dedicate part of my speech to Ross Greer, at least, in this, the 150th anniversary of the year, year of the birth of Sir Winston Churchill, who, of course, has been such an inspiration to the notorious reputation Mr Greer has managed to secure. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <laughs> thank you. And I call on Michael Matheson to wind up. Cabinet Secretary. Right, thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I apologise for being slightly late for the beginning of this uh, debate to colleagues across the chamber. Um, Presiding Officer, I am conscious that in any debate about public sector services and public sector reform that we all have a vested interest in them because we all make use of them and we will all be dependent upon them at some point, whether that be from the point of our health service or education system or transport system or other parts of the public sector, we all have an interest in making sure that we have the most effective, most efficient and that we have public services that can deliver the best outcomes for citizens right across the country. And I think despite the political differences which we have in this chamber over some aspects of these, I think we all share a view that we want our public services to be successful and to be effective. Prior to this debate, I was reflecting on the issue of public sector reform. And very often the discourse and debate around public sector reform very often focuses on the here and now, the bit that we have experienced here in this chamber or we have witnessed moving through this political uh, space. However, reform of our public sector and change in our public sector has always been with us. Probably one of the biggest and most significant public reforms that took place in the whole of the UK in the last 50 years was the introduction of the NHS and Community Care Act back in 1990. For some of you, it was at the start of my, uh, my own career in the health service, it was at the time when uh, the UK government made the decision to move away from institutional-based care, long-stay care for those with mental health and women with disabilities and our complex needs, into a community-based approach, recognising the need for fundamental reform on how services would have to be delivered in the future. And that, in my view, is probably one of the most significant social policy changes that's happened in the course of the last 50 years. And at that time, it faced a great deal of criticism there were challenges in its implementation where care wasn't delivered in the right way. The funding wasn't necessary in order to help to support the transition from institutional care into community-based care because community-based care was more expensive in the delivery of uh, the care for individuals with complex needs. But notwithstanding those challenges in its implementation, notwithstanding the problems that occurred at that particular point, it was the right policy decision to take forward. Because had it not been taken forward at that particular point, the challenges which we would have faced in public sector reform would have been even greater. Which brings me to my point, and that is that I think there is a danger at times when it comes to public sector reform that we always characterise it as being a failure. The reality is that there has been public sector reform taking place over many decades, which has had challenges but has also been necessary and has also been the right thing uh, to do. I want to pick up on a couple of examples of what I believe have been very good public sector reforms that have been taken forward that very often will go under the radar. And I want to do it on the basis of trying not to overly focus on the issue of structural reform as being the way in which you deliver public sector reform. In my view, very often, structural reform is the easy part of it. I think, as Ivan McKee made in his own contribution, the real challenge in public sector reform is cultural change in being able to change the way in which a service is delivered. But I want to give three examples where no structural reform took place, but cultural change made a real difference to how services were delivered. One of the most notable over the course of the last 15 years has been introduction of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, a programme that was about addressing the issue 
of unnecessary deaths taking place within our health service and to be able to identify where they were occurring and to be able to take action in order to prevent it from happening. The introduction of that programme wasn't about changing health board boundaries. It wasn't about changing the structures within hospitals in terms of the management structure. It was about cultural change and empowering staff to be able to make that decision and able to make the change that was necessary. I'll give way to... Michelle, Michelle Thompson. For, for giving way, and I'd just like to put it on the record that I strongly agree with what he's saying uh, in one of my multiple previous lives where I delivered large-scale transformational changes in corporate companies. The vast majority of change programmes failed because of a, a failure to take cognizance of the prevailing culture, and it's a well-known management statistic. I completely agree with what he's saying. Cameron Thank you. And, I, I, and I, I think very often it's we focus on the structural change rather than some of the changes which have taken place in our public services over the course of the last two decades. And the patient safety programme is not just something because we introduced it as a government, it's something which is internationally recognised as being one of the most comprehensive patient safety programmes of its type anywhere in the world. And that was about enabling staff and empowering staff to be able to make the right decisions. Another aspect of public sector reform that I think is often forgotten about has been a very significant change, and it came from the challenge that was set out in the Christie report about the need to move from symptom management to being much more focused on the preventative measures and how public sector or public sector operates. And that is an area of youth justice. We've gone from an environment as a result of the Christie report where we had Pullman Young Offenders Institution overcrowded to the point where it is now or was half empty. Why? Because of a change in approach in order to be much more preventative focus in addressing offending behaviour at a critical stage. Moving away from this dependency and having to force people into the system and thinking, yep, that's how the system knows best, put them into jail, that will solve the problem to recognising actually it doesn't work very effectively. It's much more effective if you can deal with the upstream and you can prevent these crimes from happening in the first place. And the youth justice system, in my view, again, is a very good example of how we've been able to reform our public services without the need for structural reform but in a way that has been much more meaningful and has changed the way in which those services are delivered. And in the other area, and I see this on the basis of Campbell Christie given his own background on this issue, and some members may recognise this, but I've got a constituent's interest in that, and that is in relation to the way in which Scottish canals or British waterways operated. An organisation that was very often sitting in the background, doing very little other than management, managing a bit of infrastructure within our country that very often very little use was made of. Campbell Christie, during the course of his chair of that, moved British waterways into Scottish canals, moved it from being a man asset management organisation into being an economic development organisation, helping to use our canals to unlock potential in areas not more so than my own constituency in Falkirk, with the Falkirk wheel and the way in which that's, flowed, that's flowed right through into the Kelpies and also the way in which has led to significant investment in areas such as around at Springburn. Again, a public service body taking a different approach, no structural change, but recognising they've had a more important role to play than just managing the assets that they hold and taking a much more holistic approach to how they can support communities. I'll give way to Paul Sweeney. Uh, Paul Sweeney. I appreciate the, the Cabinet Secretary giving way on that point. I recognise the, the huge transformation that Scottish Canals has achieved, particularly in the Glasgow Canal section of the Forth and Clyde Canal. Um, does he recognise a large part of that was down to its structure as a public corporation and changing it most recently into a non-departmental public body has placed fiscal constraints on the organisation that may challenge its ability to do those more entrepreneurial activities and maybe we need to look again at the structure of the public corporation? Yeah, look, I, I, I recognise that and I, and I make that point because a number of people have made reference to the Christie report and Campbell Christie was the chair of uh, Bridge Waterways and also when it moved into becoming Scottish Canals when the UK government decided to abolish uh, uh, at Bridges Waterways. Um, I think the issue that you reference is a, an issue around um, uh, Treasury rules, which have led to the challenge which we've had to uh, address, which I know is not ideal and it does place constraints on it. But I, I, I offer it up as an example of a very good, I think, a very good public body making a real difference in communities, particularly in deprived areas, that will, uh, is using assets and unlocking them in a way 
that have much greater benefit now. And you only have to look around, as a member I know, around Springburn, the real difference that it has made to that area, around Mary Hill, at the back of Fair Hill, etc., opened up an area that previously people just would not have simply gone uh, because of the approach, the economic development approach that they have uh, taken. And I think we have to encourage more of our public bodies to be able uh, to do that. I also want to address the issue which a number of members have made reference to as the challenges which we have around health care and I think um, Jackson Carlaw and Michael Mara made reference to this in terms of demographic challenges which we face. Some of the early policy options that we made back in uh, the early part of this parliament uh, also still have to be funded. For example, uh, free personal care, etc. The decisions that were made then, uh, given the demographic shift that we face at the present moment. That's the same challenge which we will face in our health and social care system going forward. And it will have to reform and it will have to change in order to meet that demand not just because of the demographic challenge which we face, but also the disease burden which we face as a country. The disease burden is estimated to increase by about 21% alone over the course of the next 20 years. We can't simply think that we can continue an existing model and it will deliver for us. Right now we have a health and social care system that, if I can just make, finish this point, I'll give way to the member. I, I, am I to five o'clock? So, uh, so I'll keep going then. <laughs> but uh, call, but if I, if I, if I, I want to make this point because if you look at the way in which your health and social care system has historically, over many decades, over many governments, has traditionally operated. In terms of its priorities, it has been secondary care, primary care, social care, and then the individual, the patient themselves. In reality, our system has to be completely flipped. It has to be much more patient-focused, much more social care focused, much more primary care focused, and then secondary care. That will require very significant change in our health and social care system over the course of the next decade. But if we are to meet that demographic challenge, if we are to meet that disease burden which we face in the future, we are going to have to address that. And that will require the point that Alec Neil was making those years ago. It will require greater collaboration and cooperation across this chamber to have a mature, reasoned conversation about what we can realistically provide and how that can be delivered in the years ahead. And that will require us to, dare I say, President Officer, to try to take some of the party politics out of the decision-making process in order to make sure that we make the right decisions for the future in order to deliver better outcomes for those who will make use of those public services. I will give way to Michael Mara. I Michael appreciate Mara. the Minister giving way. He recognises two points. The first, that one, many of the problems in our uh, health system, as well as our social care system, comes from that demographic transition in which we are, we are undertaking. The second, he would recognise that this is well and long predicted. That actually precedes, precedes the advent of this government in 2007. We knew the demographic trajectory of this country. So why, nearly 17 years on, are we just having the beginnings, it would seem, of this conversation of trying to build that consensus when you've known all along that this had to be done? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think, I don't think that's a, a fair characterisation because uh, throughout my time in this parliament there have been various debates and discussions and attempts to try to engage in public sector reform and to have reasoned debate around some of these issues. So let, let me just take, for example, if you look at the issue that we are trying to deal with around delayed discharges, you know, delayed discharges are not a new thing within our health and social care system. They predate where they are. Well, they're not actually, but they predate uh, where they have, uh, they predate uh, even this government, actually even this parliament as well. You know, long there have been various iterations to try and address it. We've had joint futures, we, had, uh, we, had, uh, we then had the structural change, which was the new trust that were introduced as well. We then introduced, I, I will, if I could just make this point, we then, we then had uh, different approaches to try to deliver greater integration, all of which have helped to a small degree, but they have not been able to take it to the full extent that is actually required, which is why I think, and I'll come back to this point, where I think a national care service is going to be critical to helping to support us in achieving that. I'll give way to Mr. Swinney. Yeah, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Wouldn't the short answer to Mr Mara's intervention be the Government initiated the Christie Commission 13 years ago and has spent the last 13 years implementing its outcomes? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. And I've, I've, made reference, I've made reference to a couple of points where we have made progress with issues around the Christie principles. But I, I want to just turn back to this issue about the, the National Care Service because it is a huge reform and it is a reform we need to get right. 
And my view is that it's important we take the right time in order to manage that reform, because a top-down approach to the creation of a national care service will not work. We need to work in a collaborative, cooperative fashion, which is why the extra time we've taken with Clausler and others is an attempt by us to try and help to achieve that. We've made progress. There is more we need to do, but it's critical that we get it right. Now, I hope, and I know the criticism from the government, I presume that or the Labour Party, I presume that you still support the creation of a national care service. But if we are, if we are to change the system to make it patient, social care, primary care, secondary care as our four key priorities, the National Care Service will be critical to supporting us in achieving that, which is why we need to get it right and we need to make sure that engagement is taken forward correctly. Senator Officer, can I say that we always must learn from the reforms that we have taken forward where they have not progressed as well as they can, and I hope the approach that we're taking with the National Care Service is a genuine attempt and a recognition on our part, a genuine attempt in order to try to seek to do that. But in, officer, in drawing this debate to a close, there will be a need for us to significantly reform and change our public services going forward. But I also want to put on record my huge thanks for the thousands of public sector workers across Scotland who work day in, day out and deliver excellent and outstanding services where they can. I recognise the challenges and this government recognises the challenges which they face, and we as a government will continue to do everything we can to support them in the important role they play within Scottish society. Thank you. And that concludes the debate on Scotland's public service values, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Sandesh Gulhani is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Michael Mara will fall. The first question is that Amendment 11831.2 in the name of Sandesh Gilhani, which seeks to amend Motion 11831 in the name of Shona Robison on Scotland's public service values, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting. <laughs>